So this audio lecture will be looking at cell division, which is one of the topics covered in chapter 18. There is another audio lecture for apoptosis, which is also a concept that's covered in chapter 18 in our textbook. Okay. So when we look at cell division, we would recognize this as being mitosis. So this is the process of going from a single cell to um, replicating the necessary material um, and then allowing for those cells to divide into two daughter cells. And again, we recognize this as the process of mitosis. Um, but for a complete cycle, we have additional phases in which the cells are going to go through besides just mitosis because it's not that cells are constantly dividing. Um, they need to have checkpoints to make sure that cell division is the correct response. Um, so linking this with our previous um, unit where we were talking about cell signaling and how we get a cell response and that cell response might be proliferation, mitosis, or it may not be that, it may be apoptosis where we get cell death. Um, and so we wanna keep in mind that we have to have checkpoints where the cell is checking to make sure it has the signals, um, the regulation to move forward to the next step. So if we look at the process of cell division and kind of simplify it, our first step is where we're gonna have growth. We also need to replicate the chromosomes, um, you know, the instruction manual for life, the DNA needs to be copied. Um, and the next step is actually to take those chromosomes and segregate and separate those. And that begins in the process of mitosis um, and we'll talk briefly about the different steps of mitosis. Then we actually have the pinching off um, cytokinesis where the cytoplasm is going to be divided. And that's where we actually go into our third step, true cell division, where we have our two daughter cells arising. Um, again, this is kind of a simplistic view of this. Um, if we look at our next figure, we can see how this process is actually a little bit more complicated in getting to the point where a cell is actually going to divide. We actually have three additional steps, right? So if we look at an overview of the cell cycle, there are going to be four steps or stages, phases, um, depending upon what figure you're looking at, um, that lead to cell, the cell cycle. So starting at G1 phase, um, G1 phase is where we're going to have the cell growing. Um, during S phase, this is where DNA is going to be replicated. G2 phase is an additional step of cell growth um, because eventually it's going to divide, right? So we need to make sure that we have these periods of growth. We have periods of replication. Now G1, S and G2 are all part of what we'd recognize as interphase, okay? And so we want to realize that a cell for most of its life um, is going to be in interphase. Interphase is where the cell is actually um, doing what its function is. Um, and so for most cells, their function is not achieved during mitosis, during M phase. Um, it would be during these other three phases where we're in, where the cell is in interphase. And that's where it would spend the majority of its time because this is where it's undergoing biochemical processes. And again, replicating material and growing. Okay. So after G2 phase, this is when it would, um, because it's replicated its, um, genome, its DNA, it would enter into M phase. And the first step of that is actually separating those chromosomes. Um, so that would be the mitosis or nuclear division. And then we need to um, separate the cytoplasm. So that would be cytokinesis. So we'll talk about those steps again a little bit later on. So one of the ways to look at cell division is through the use of a technique called um, FACS or cell sorting or flow cytometric. Um, so in this case, what happens is that you can label the DNA um, with a fluorescent dye. Um, and so as the cell divides, you can actually see the generations that happen because the amount of DNA that is labeled. Um, you're not adding new label in. Label in. So um, as the cell divides, it's going to get halved each time. Um, and so it's one, ways that, one way that a researcher can look at to see whether cells are actually going through cell division, whether they're proliferating or not. Um, 
you know, I'm an immunologist, so this is definitely done in for immune cells. So if you want to see whether T cells are activated and dividing, um, increasing in number, you can, again, um, treat them with a chemical that's fluorescent that you can detect using a fax machine. Not the fax machine that you'd send a message, but fax machine that you could measure kind of like um, a speck, but you keep the cells whole and the cells actually go through. Um, and so when they go through the laser, um, if they have the dye, um, you would record that. And the amount, the intensity is also recorded. So again, the intensity would go down with each generation of cell division. Okay, so that's a little bit about how that works. And so in doing this, um, you can look at different time points and then you can measure the length of time that the cells are in between the divisions. Okay, um, and so that's more or less what we're looking at in this figure here from the textbook. And this actually comes from one of the questions um, in your textbook. Um, and there's some additional labeling that was done in previous editions of the textbook. But we can see in the first peak, this is where the cell is going to be in G1 phase. Okay, so again, this is where growth is going to happen. And so we don't see any decrease, right? We have the same kind of peak of the cells. But as the cells enter into S phase, where they're undergoing the DNA replication, um, the amount of... Um, fluorescent dye available is going to be decreased because it's being divided, okay? And then as the cell enters into G2 M phase, now we have stabilized those and so it's gonna get divided and we're gonna have this second population of cells, okay? So um, probably for our tech talk, we'll talk about flow um, or fax analysis cell sorting, okay? so. So when we look at the cell cycling, there's a number of control points between these steps um, that make it so that we don't enter into the next step unless we're ready. So there's kind of these like questions that the cell's going to ask whether certain signals have been met um, or not. And so again, starting at G1, um, we can see our first checkpoint is a start checkpoint. So we're not going to replicate DNA unless the environment is favorable. So the cell does kind of like a, okay, you know, do we have the resources we need? Is the environment favorable? Do we need to divide? Um, because again, there's no point in making DNA if you're not going to actually divide. And so if that checkpoint is given like it's all clear, then we would end up going into S phase. Okay. The next checkpoint is the M, the G2 M checkpoint. And so again, is all the DNA replicated? Is the environment favorable? Because there's no point in going through the process of rearranging microtubules, um, pulling those chromosomes apart, and undergoing cytokinesis if cell division isn't necessary, or if you haven't done DNA replication correctly, right? So if that checkpoint is met, then you would enter into mitosis, okay? Now we have to make sure that all those chromosomes are actually attached to spindles so that they would be able to separate, right? So that's why in metaphase, um, you're gonna have those chromosomes lining up. Again, we wanna make sure they're attached to spindles, to microtubules, so that they can get then get pulled apart in anaphase, right? Um, and so that's another checkpoint that happens um, where there's an assessment, okay. Is everything good? Um, and that would trigger anaphase and then cytokinesis. So it's kind of like the cells moving forward in the process, halts, kind of like a stop sign being put up, and then, okay, move to the next phase. Okay, all right, you've met the requirements, move on to the next phase. Okay, so these checkpoints uh, allow for the, the cell to be very energy efficient because it's not going to go into the next step, which is energy requiring unless it is ready. So cell cycle progression is regulated by uh, kinases, so whether they're activated. Um, so cycling-dependent kinases, or CDKs, 
are going to be inactive unless they're bound to cycling, as we can see in our panel to the right. Um, once the kinases become activated, when they bind cycling, they can phosphorylate um, targets. And when these targets are phosphorylated, they become activated and they will allow for the cell cycle to continue. Okay, so a couple important things to keep in mind is that cycling dependent kinases or CDK levels remain constant through the, through the cell cycle. It's just whether they become activated or are inactivated. So you always have 100% of CDKs. Um, and if, um, if we're looking at it like M cycling, um, the CDK that's responsible for the progression into the M phase, the met, uh, mitosis, um, we would see that there would be an increased percentage of those CDKs activated um, when um, M phase is initiated. Okay, so and that's what we're seeing on our panel on our left. Um, that pink line, M cycling concentration, um, refers to the activated complexes. So the cyclin dependent kinase and the M cyclin binding together, being activated. And so you can see how that increases, and that increase where it's peaked has now initiated mitosis to occur. Okay. Um, so cyclins then end up getting, um, they, the cyclins themselves will actually be degra degraded when they're not bound to the cycling dependent kinases. So the cyclins themselves um, change in the amount. So if you, if a cell is looking to initiate mitosis, they're gonna have to produce M cycling. So there's the step, the step of regulation in how much cyclins are present. Um, and then the other step of regulation is that um, activation of the kinase and then we also have regulation of phosphorylation of our targets, right? So this multi-level of regulation allows to make a way to allow to make sure that cell cycling, the cell cycling isn't progression progressing unless all signals say go. Okay. So different um, cycling dependent kinases or CDKs are associated and bind to different cyclins um, in each pair are going to trigger different steps, different events of the cell cycle. So S cyclin is going to bind to S CDK. And when they bind, that's going to activate the kinase so the kinase can phosphorylate. And that is what's going to lead to um, the S phase being progressed, right? So we have our checkpoint, our start checkpoint. Um, and so S cyclin binding to SCDK is what is going to allow for the entry into our S phase, where our M cycling binding to MCDK that allows the MCDK to become activated, and that's what's going to be at our G2M checkpoint. So once that becomes activated, phosphorylates. Um, targets, that's going to allow for um, progression into M phase or mitosis. Okay, there are additional cyclins for G1, um, okay, and that are going to allow for that progression. Okay, so again, it's your cyclin and your CDK are different for each of the different um, checkpoints. So as I mentioned, cyclins get degraded after they're activated for the particular stage of the cell cycle. So here we can see how we have this activated cyclin and CDK complex. And what happens is the cyclin actually gets ubiquinated um, by APC. The APC stands for anaphase promoting complex. So just keep in mind that for cell cycle, when you see APC, that is anaphase promoting complex. So APC, if you've taken immunology, means antigen presenting cell. That is not the case here. Also, if you looked at the Wnt pathway, um, the signaling pathway regulator is called APC. So again, um, 
the problem with abbreviations is sometimes they can stand for multiple things. So keep in mind that if you, for this unit, um, for cell cycle, when we talk about APC, we're talking about anaphase promoting complex. Um, when we talk about apoptosis and necrosis in our other audio lecture, we'll talk about APCs. And again, this is an immune cell. So just try to keep those terms um, straight. So again, um, this anaphase promoting complex is going to um, ubiquinate the cyclin. Um, and so you can see how that labels the cyclin and that actually causes the cyclin to end up being um, destroyed by the um, protosome. This leaves the um, cyclic um, cycling dependent kinase, the CDK, inactivated. So it has to wait for more cycling to be produced so that it then um, can bind to the cycling and become reactivated. So this is one way which we can prolong certain phases, right? So if we have, if we destroy the cycling, we have to resynthesize the cycling. And so again, um, that process is going to take time. So it would prolong the phase um, before we can move to the next step. So another way which um, CDK's activity can be regulated um, or controlled besides just the availability of their um, cyclin is also by um, phosphorylation. So there's inhibitory phosphorylation sites. So there are kinases like we one um, that will phosphorylate the CDK and when it's phosphorylated, um, it's not going to be able to be activated. Um, and so there's a number of um, phosphatases um, that work in parallel with them to then activate them. So um, CD, CDC25 is an activating um, phosphatase, and so it will allow the CDK to become phosphorylated. So um, you, what you should know and appreciate is that, again, we can regulate, um, control the activation of the CDKs through phosphorylation. So there can also be inhibitory proteins that will bind to the um, CDK um, to control its activity. Um, so we, here we have P27 um, binding to our cycling CDK complex. Um, and in that case, it can't phosphorylate its target. Um, and so it would not be able to activate. So when we look at the process of some some of the different eukaryotic cells in their cell cycle time. Um, this is cells that are, you know, all the, all the questions are being answered in the correct way, right? So the environment is favorable for cell division. Um, these are cells that um, are known to proliferate um, that constantly have to go under cell division. We'll talk a little bit about this um, after, like as I go through this chart. Um, but you can see that the amount of time for the cell cycle to be completed varies, right? So um, first on our list is our, embry our frog embryo cells, right, early on. So um, these cells obviously are going to have to grow and divide and increase in number. And there's a video that I posted um, in our unit four files um, that you should watch. Um, so those you can see that those embryo cells are dividing. And so the cell cycle time is going to be relatively short, 30 minutes between divisions, because these checkpoints are going to get met very quickly, because one of the things that the embryo is going to want to do is increase the number of cells so that there's enough cells so that we can start to specialize those cells and that those early developmental um, cues that are happening can happen so that we can have um, the different um, embryonic tissues being developed, okay? Then if we look at yeast cells, um, yeast cells are eukaryotic, but very um, basic, simple, um, evolutionary. And so um, they're going to under this go mitosis relatively easily as long as there's food source environment is favorable. And so their cell cycle time is about an hour and a half. 
Um, if we look at um, intestinal epithelial cells, their cell cycling time can be about tw 12 hours. Um, so compared to the yeast cells and embryo cells, the frog embryo cells, that's pretty long. Um, but again, that's if we think about our average cell in our body, that's going to be relatively short. Because if we think about the function of intestinal epithelial cells, there's constantly going to be material moving through our intestines that are going to hit up against those epithelial cells. And um, they're going to, yes, we're producing mucus to line them, but they're still going to be more prone to damage than some of our other tissues. And so their replacement time, the time in which they're going to need cell division so that they can um, undergo mitosis, so that they can... Um, undergo things like wound healing are, is going to be shorter than other tissues. Okay, if we look at fibroblast um, cells in culture, um, their cell cycle time is about 20 hours. So if you're culturing cells in the lab, um, in vitro, um, we would keep that in mind. So some cells are going to divide quicker than other cells. And so the, the passage time um, between the times where you have to divide the cells and put them into new petri dishes would vary. So some cells that are grown in culture grow very slowly. Um, and so you might be able to only passage them once a week, um, where other cells like these fibroblasts and like HeLa cells, they're gonna divide really quickly. <laughs> and so um, you would need to um, passage them maybe every other day. Um, so the other important thing to keep in mind when we're talking about cell lines, um, cells that are going to be grown in culture in vitro, um, many of those cell lines have been transformed. Um, so they actually have checkpoint genes um, mutated because they originate from cancer cell lines or they've been infected with a virus um, that allows them to be grown in culture. So their cell cycle is going to be off or different than what we would see in normal cells. Okay, so um, sometimes uh, researchers will actually culture cells that are freshly harvested um, or from like a biopsy. And in those cases, those cells are going to grow a little bit more truer unless it's like cancerous cells. But again, because cancer has uh, mutations to their checkpoints. So there are going to be a number of different mechanisms that allow for pause of the cell cycle. Okay, and so we can see here where we have our checkpoint, our S, our start um, checkpoint between G1 and S phase, that we can actually have inhibitors that are going to block that entry, that checkpoint from being met. Our checkpoint, our G2M checkpoint, we can have phosphatases. Um, that are being inhibited, so those activating phosphatases actually will get inhibited, so that will block entry into mitosis. And then we have our checkpoint for cytokinesis, and so we can have inhibition of the anaphase promoting complex, the APC, um, that activation gets inhibited, so that's going to delay that exit from mitosis and entry into G1. Okay. Um, and so this is important because the same kind of questions are being asked, right? And so if the environment's not favorable, we need to have those inhibitors to um, block the entry into S phase. If the DNA is not being replicated or the DNA is damaged, we want to make sure that we're not entering into M phase. Okay, and if those chromosomes did not attach properly, we don't want to divide the cell. Okay, so we don't want to enter um, into cytokinesis um, anaphase. Okay. So next what we're going to do is look at each one of these phases a little more closely. Um, again, keep in mind that the goal here is for cell division to happen, but we're going to have these checkpoints um, along the way. And so before we can proceed to the next step, that checkpoint has to um, be met. Um, so how is cell proliferation controlled? Um, and so first I want to say that we don't completely understand 
<laughs> and so this is an area of research. Um, this is an area of research because of cancer biology, so understanding how cancer and how we can potentially target cancer um, because cancer is a dysregulation of cell proliferation, um, but also from a developmental aspect. Um, so if we look at various organisms, um, when we look at how they begin a fertilized egg, those eggs can be the same size in different organisms, but yet the product after cell proliferation is different, right? So both in size, but also the organisms themselves, right? And so again, this is an area of research and what factors determine the organism that arises and the differences in sizes. And so when we look at an organ in your body, or you can even look at the big scale of you, um, your size, of your organ of you is determined by the total cell mass and that's made up of the number of the cells and the size of the cells right the number of cells are controlled by two different factors proliferation versus cell death right so we can have um, a rate of proliferation a number of generations of cells to get to that cell mass but if cell death is happening at a higher frequency, then we're never gonna get the number of cells we need. So again, those two factors play a role in what is the number of cells that are present, okay? So with proliferation and cell death, there are a number of different um, intracellular and extracellular signals um, that are, can control these processes as they happen. So this extracellular and intracellular um, steps that are at play in promoting cell proliferation are controlled by mitogens, okay? So again, keep in mind that unicellular organisms are grow and divide. As fast as their environments let them, one of the ways that the cue can be given is through these chemicals called mitogens, okay? And it's only if they receive this signal, right, a cell signal, that they're going to get the stimuli in which they need in order to have a cellular response, and that cellular response being cell proliferation. So one of the ways that the role of mitogens were looked at and studied and explored were by taking blood and separating it into different components. Um, so what investigators realized was that if you took blood serum, that could actually promote cell division. So if you expose cells to it, um, the blood serum samples those cells would divide. Where if you took plasma, which is a further separation of the blood, this did not promote cell division, so the cells would not divide, okay? Now the difference between these two, perhaps the blood serum and plasma, is that blood serum actually has clotting material in it. Um, so it has platelets, which allow for clots to form, where the plasma does not. So looking further at these two um, different samples and looking at platelets, it would suggest that the plates of, platelets are producing and secreting a mitogen. What was found was that this mitogen um, called platelet-derived growth factor um, actually can bind receptor tyrosine kinase. Um, you might remember that from cell signaling. And so when receptor tyrosine kinase is activated, we are going to get intracellular um, activation of intracellular signaling pathways. And lo and behold, we'll look at in the next slide how this actually leads to um, transcription regulation changes, translation, and cell proliferation. Um, now, there is a number of in inhibitory mechanisms that have to be overcome in order for cell division to be promoted, but this mitogen platelet-derived growth factor allows for this to happen because of the cell signaling that happens. So in this figure, we're looking at how the mitogen is able to activate cell division, okay? And we can think of our mitogen as being our platelet-derived growth factor. So it's going to bind to the receptor tyrosine kinase. We're going to get the intercellular signaling pathways um, occurring. So those second messengers are going to get activated. Um, and then what that actually does is stimulates the G1 um, CDK to become activated. So we can see here how um, 
is going to become activated. And the way it does that is by inactivating this retroblasta blastoma um, protein, or the what is abbreviated as RB. Okay, so we can see how this is activated. It's going to be inhibiting um, transcription. But then when we get phosphorylation of the RB protein, it becomes inactive. So it's going to um, become dislodged. It's not going to bind to those um, transcription regulator. That transcription regulator can now allow for transcription to occur. So we're going to get protein expression through translation, and that's going to allow for the growth of the cell so that we can get cell proliferation. Okay. So again, this is just showing you a little bit of that mechanism of how these mitogens are going to allow for activation. So we're going to look a little bit more at these um, proteins that are, are involved. So we will be looking at um, RB next. So retinoblastoma, RB proteins, again, they're going to inhibit transcription. So they actually will bind to transcriptional um, regulators. Um, and inhibit them. So they bind one of these transcriptional um, regulators or transcriptional activators is E2F. So RB proteins bind to it so that R2F cannot cause transcription to happen. And so they're binding to the promoter regions of genes that are going to be involved in S phase. So by phosphorylating RB by the CDK, this is going to allow for that transcriptional um, activator to be able to turn those genes on that are necessary for progression into S phase. So such as the G1S cyclin, um, S cyclin, and other proteins that are going to be involved with DNA synthesis um, because we're going to need to, um, in the whole point of S phase is to get chromosome um, replication, duplication. Okay. So again, here in this figure, you can see how R2F becomes activated when RB is deactivated or inhibited because of that phosphorylation of the CDK by the CDK. Okay, and that the CDK, I mean, if we go backwards, <laughs> the CDK has become activated because it has bound to its cyclin. Okay, and all that is initiated because of the mitogen that has bound its receptor and those second messengers becoming activated. Um, so one way to block the exit from G1 phase, meaning that we would enter, um, we're blocking entry into our S phase. So this would be our start checkpoint. Um, is through p53 okay and so we're going to talk about what's normal first um, but most of you probably have heard of p53 because of its role in cancer okay so um, keep in mind first we're going to talk about what's normal <laughs> and then we'll talk what happens in cancer so normally what happens is that p53 um, if your DNA is intact and everything is normal, p53 actually gets degraded by the protosome, um, and so that we then can enter into S phase, so we can replicate the DNA, um, and that we can um, move along into mitosis, right? But the checkpoint has been reached, okay? So if our DNA is damaged, what we want to happen, what normally would happen, is that P53 then gets phosphorylated, okay? And when it gets phosphorylated, then um, it's going to bind to the regulatory site of P21 gene. P21, that gene codes for a CDK inhibitor protein. Um, so it would, P21 binds to the CDK and doesn't allow it to become activated, right? So keep in mind that if um, the CDK becomes activated, it's going to be able to phosphorylate, and that's going to allow us to replicate the DNA. So that's going to allow for the start checkpoint to be met 
so that we can then go into the S phase and replicate the DNA. But we don't want this to happen because the DNA is damaged. So our P21 inhibitor allows for this to be a stop, right? Wait, DNA is damaged. We don't want to replicate this DNA. This cell should not go on to divide because it has damaged DNA. So again, that's what normally would happen is that if we have damaged DNA, P53 would get phosphorylated. It would then cause P21 to be expressed. P21, because it is a CDK inhibitor, would bind to the CDK and not allow for S phase to be entered. Um, so we would stop the exit from G1 phase and moving into S phase. That's normally what would happen, right? So that this cell would not be allowed to replicate its DNA, would not be allowed to divide because it's um, quote unquote a bad cell because it's been damaged. The DNA needs to be repaired before it can move on. Okay. So in a cancer cell, it, there's that two hit theory. Um, and so there's a break in the DNA, there's a damage in the DNA. Maybe this is because of UV exposure um, or um, exposure to toxins, um, but the second hit could be damage to a um, checkpoint, such as the start um, checkpoint, right? And so if P53 has a mutation in it, that means that it doesn't get phosphorylated. This means that this pathway on the right here, this figure never happens, right? So we're, we're not gonna get P21 activated, expressed. So we're not gonna get the CDK inhibited, right? So what's gonna happen is because of that mutation to P53, P53 is gonna get degraded even though we have damaged DNA, which means that our CDK is going to become is going to be activated, so that we move into S phase and we replicate that damaged DNA, and that damaged DNA then gets spread between two daughter cells, and those two daughter cells continue the process and continue the process, and then we have tumor. Okay, so again, just try um, try to keep this figure shows you what happens in a normal cell. And um, maybe this is my misconception, um, but again, I think a lot of us know about P53 because of its role in cancer. And so this is not looking what's happening in a cancer cell. Keep in mind, in a cancer cell, what happens is that the P53 is um, damaged, mutated, so that it does get degraded, even though there is a damaged DNA. Okay, um, and obviously that's not all cancers, that's just some cancers. And so in the next slide there is a video, um, so I'm gonna, for the audio lecture, I'm gonna jump through that, but um, worth checking out the video on P53 and its binding to DNA um, for more on this topic. So next one, you know, if everything's gone right, we DNA is not damaged, um, P53 gets degraded. This allows for um, enter into S phase, um, and this has happened because we've had those um, cyclins binding to the CDKs, phosphorylating, and allowing for um, replication of um, the DNA. We're going to be in S phase, okay? And so once we're in S phase, um, the kind of checklist that has to happen is that we have to replicate the DNA. Um, and so we see this here, how helicase is going to get activated. Um, and so helicase is going to open up the chromosomes so that we can get the replication fork. We can get DNA polymerase binding so that we get um, completion of DNA replication. Now we have to make sure that that replication um, occurs and that it's successful, so it's complete, so that we have a copy um, of, of the genomic information. We also have to make a copy of the centrosome so that mitotic 
um, organizations um, center. Um, we need to make sure that we have two of those so that we have two poles so that eventually when we're moving into M phase that we have those chromosomes moving to separate poles. So remember for um, to transition from S phase to G2 phase that there's no checkpoint here. So once the cell has committed to S phase, it's committing to G2 phase, okay? And so um, it's committed to that cell division and making, so it needs to make sure that the DNA replication is completed. Um, so there is a checkpoint, right, um, at the G2 to M phase before it goes into mitosis. Um, so again, G2 is going to be your last point to make sure that DNA replication is complete um, and done successfully. Um, so generally, um, issues with DNA replication are due to stalled replication forks. Right? The re replication forks are moving and opening up um, along the chromosomes with helicase. And so sometimes um, there's stalled replication um, forks because there's not enough nucleotides in order to complete the synthesis. Um, and so um, there are different strategies in order for um, to deal with this depending on the organisms. So for uh, unicellular organisms, generally it just delays the, um, the movement past into M phase. So this checkpoint, um, it will just kind of stall there and wait for there to be enough nucleotides to complete it. And so it will eventually continue. With multicellular organisms, a lot of times these cells are actually targeted for apoptosis. Okay, and this is done through p53 mechanisms. And we'll talk more about apoptosis um, later on in our second audio lecture for this chapter. So looking at the G2M checkpoint, um, this is really important because there can be DNA damage that can occur during the S phase, during the synthesis of DNA. Um, and this could be an incorporation of bases, um, maybe there's exposure to radiation or different chemicals um, that caught, or lead to mutations and changes. Um, so it's, it's in, this checkpoint, Point is important because it's going to block cell division if there's DNA damage that has occurred. So if um, DNA damage has occurred, there's kinases that are able to recognize that and they will phosphorylate um, targets, other kinases um, that actually lead to cell cycle arrest. So ATM and ATR are kinases um, that are associated with DNA damage sites. They will phosphorylate CHK1 and CHK2 kinases, and that will lead to cell cycle arrest. So keep in mind that we have our M um, cyclin and our MCDK. So these are going to be responsible for allowing us to move into metaphase and exit um, G2 phase. And so activation of um, CDC25 is going to allow for um, activation of our MCDK and when it's binding to it. So we'll remove any of those inhibitory um, phosph um, phosphates um, sites so that we again can move through um, so that we can um, actually end up having mitosis occur. Okay, so for M phase, the events that are going to be happening um, in order for mitosis to be completed is that the cells have to condense the DNA, um, and so we need to form our sister chroma chromatids and have those paired together. Um, we need to make sure that the nuclear envelope is going to break down um, so that we have the whole cell in order for um, the chromosomes to line up and to be then separated um, through the different stages of mitosis. We've already duplicated our centrosomes, um, so that's, that's gonna happen in S phase. So we're gonna have those poles being, um, we're gonna make sure that those centrosomes are being moved to different, the different poles. And we wanna make sure that the DNA is gonna be um, distributed between the two different daughter cells. And so line those up through in along the metaphase plate 
allows that to happen. And then lastly, once those have been um, separated to our different daughter cells, then we're going to end up cleaving the mother cell into two daughter cells. So as we mentioned, the centrosomes um, are going to be duplicated during the S phase, but during the M phase is when they're going to separate to the um, different poles, and that's what we're seeing in our um, figure here. Um, so again, you have the centrosome. This is where our um, microtubules are going to be growing from. Um, so negative ends near the centrosome and positive ends to the outside. Um, so that's going to get replicated. So we're actually going to have two present during S and G2 phase. And then during M phase, they're actually going to move to the separate poles so that we can get the metodic, uh, metodic spindles being formed. Um, they are going to um, anchor and bind to the centromere um, that is going to be found on each of the chromosomes so that they can line up on our metaphase. So we can see our metaphase and our metaphase spindles attaching to the chromosomes so that then during anaphase they can be separated. So keep in mind Okay, and so as these mitotic spindles have been formed, um, they're going to have the microtubules growing out, right? And we're actually going to have some of these um, microtubules overlapping or forming interpolar um, microtubules. Um, so it's going to be, there's going to be motor proteins involved, right? So we know it's either kinesin or diene, um, but it, this would be kinesin that are going to be responsible for these interpolar uh, microtubules and they're going to help stabilize this complex as it's forming. Okay, we're then going to have the kinetochore um, that's going to be found on our sister chromatids on these chromosomes, and this is where our microtubules are going to be anchored into. Um, and so when we're looking at these microtubules that are being formed, there's going to be three different microtubules, right? So there's going to be those um, overlapping ones um, that are going to be the interpole microtubules that kinesins are going to be really important in stabilizing and allowing that to happen. This is stabilizing the whole complex. We're then going to have aster microtubules. So these ones aren't anchored um, to the other poles or <laughs> to the chromosomes. And then we have the kinetochore microtubules. The kinetochore mi microtubules are going to be attached to the sister chromatids. Okay, so it's important to keep in mind these different microtubules. Um, and as we're setting up um, for metaphase, um, how these microtubules are forming, right? And so um, during metaphase, there's going to be a, like some tension going on because these chromosomes. Um, through the microtubules are going to be being aligned along that plate. Okay. Um, then we want to keep in mind what's happening to these microtubules as anaphase is occurring. So the chromosomes are only um, going to separate if the chromosomes are connected to microtubules, right? So chromosomes can't just float to the correct pole. Um, and so we need to have um, a signal that everything's aligned um, and now it's time to separate. Um, and so this process um, occurs through the anaphase promoting complex APC. Okay, and again, not the same as um, with the wind pathway, not the same with the immune system. And so um, when again, APC for cell division, anaphase promoting complex. So when this becomes activated, what it's going to do is cause um, the ubiquination and degradation of securin. Securin is inhibiting um, separase. Separase is an enzyme that is going to signal to our microtubules that they need to um, shrink and separate. Okay, um, and so once um, separase is activated. Um, the microtubules will start to um, shrink, and so the um, so that we're going to get the separation of the chromosomes. And so we can see the difference between metaphase, where our 
chromosome is being lined up and held in place by the microtubules. Um, but then after separase is activated, we're going to get cleavage and dissociation of these cohesion. Um, and so anaphase um, is initiated. So during anaphase, so during anaphase, we're going to have this remodeling of the microtubules. Um, and so motor proteins are going to play a role in this. And so when we look at anaphase, it can be divided into two steps, anaphase A and anaphase B. During anaphase A, those kinetochore microtubules are going to shorten, um, and that's going to pull those um, chromatids towards the chromosomes, towards the poles. Okay. Um, we also then have anaphase B occurring, and this is where the poles are actually going to be pushed apart from each other. And so this is actually achieved by lengthening those intrapole microtubules, right? So if we lengthen those, if those grow at the positive end, that's actually going to push the poles away. Um, and so we've already said that the motor protein that's present in the intrapole microtubules are kinesin, right? So kinesin is going to help to pull those poles away so the distance between them is further, okay? Um, this just ensures that when cytokinesis happens and we have that pinching in at what used to be the metaphase plate, um, that there's no chromosomes actually accidentally there, right? And this actually further drives those chromosomes towards their pulse. In an early in an early So then during telophase, one of the major events is this restructuring um, forming of the nuclear envelope. Okay, and so we can see in this figure how in interphase, um, going between interphase to the prometaphase, we've actually had to phosphorylate the nuclear pore proteins and the lamina so that they actually dissociate from each other. And so in the transition from um, into telophase, there's a dephosphorylation. This allows for the nuclear pore proteins and lamina to reform and to form the nuclear pore, uh, um, the nuclear envelope around the DNA, around the chromosomes. So if our checkpoint is met and cytokinesis is going to progress, um, what happens is that we have to get a cleavage furrow formed. Um, so we get this contractural ring of actin that's going to be formed to create the cleavage furrow. So we have to make sure that we increase the amount of membranes to allow for this to occur because if we're pinching in um, and we haven't increased um, the amount of membranes, we're not going to have enough membranes to actually support those two cells. So looking at this process a little um, closer, with cytokinesis, um, in our figure in panel B, we can see that contractile ring of actin um, that is going to allow for that contractile, um, that separation, that cleavage furrow to be formed. Keep in mind that myosin is the motor protein um, that is going to allow for this contraction of this actin filaments um, so that we get this pinching in. So we want to keep in mind that many human cells have a limited number of times that they can undergo cell division. And eventually, if they reach that limit, they end up in permanent cell cycle arrest. So they'll remain in um, interphase indefinitely. And so uh, an example of this is human um, fibroblasts. They can only undergo um, 25 to 50 doublings, um, even when they're given um, mitogen-promoting um, culture media. Um, so they will stop dividing after so many passages, so many doublings. Okay. Um, so this phenomena where we get this permanent cell cycle arrest is known as replicative senescence. Okay. And what research has shown is that this is um, likely due to changes in telomere structures. So at the end of chromosomes, there's a structure called telomere, and that telomere protects the chromosome, the ends especially, from DNA damage. Now, most human cells lack telomerase. Telomerase is what allows for the maintenance and maintaining of the telomere at the end of the um, chromosome. And so as you age, your telomeres get shorter, um, which then puts the ends of the chromosomes at more risk of DNA damage. And when 
the telomere length is shortened and when there's DNA damage, that is then going to activate um, P53 cell cycle arrest, right? So P53 is going to say, oops, no, you, you can't go through and, and divide because we have damaged DNA here in a normal cell, okay? Um, and so again, this, the role of telomeres in this permanent cell cycle arrest is important. Um, and obviously, like, holy grail would be how can we actually um, protect and um, allow for the telomeres to remain um, a length that allows for the DNA to be protected? Because that would be the fountain of youth, right? So again, on our cells eventually meet <laughs> the number of divisions that they can undergo. So for an organism to grow, the cells not only have to divide, but they also have to increase in size. Um, so they have to grow. Um, and so for most proliferating populations of cells, cell growth is coordinated with cell division. So we saw how um, during G1 and G2, the focus of the cell is its normal function, but also growth, right? Because we've already, in between that is going to be our S phase. So in yeast cells, cell growth is limited by the availability of nutrients. Right. But for animals, cell growth and cell division is dependent upon growth factors and mitogens. Um, so we need the two aspects. Um, so growth factors would be responsible for cell growth, where mitogens are going to be um, responsible for cell division. So some of the extracellular growth factors um, would be that there's increased protein synthesis, um, decrease in protein breakdown, increase uptake in nutrients, and also increase um, production of ATP. So we're going to need to have protein and nutrients being uptake, um, taken up, and we also have to have ATP in order to support cell growth. So one of the um, cell signaling pathways that are involved in promoting um, cell growth is the PI3 kinase. Um, it ends up activating the target of rapamycin or TOR um, and again leads to the cell response of cell growth, um, protein synthesis and cell growth. Um, so again, you can think of this as cell signaling and how it is applied with inside a cell. Um, and so it's not that I expect you to memorize this pathway, um, but just realize, appreciate um, that cell growth that response, cellular response, is due to cell signaling that occurs. So we're going to have growth factors that are going to bind to our growth factor receptor that becomes activated. That leads to the activation of PI3 kinase, which then leads to the activation of TOR, which leads to the activation of gene regulatory factors, which <laughs> leads to um, ribosome synthesis then allows for protein synthesis and um, cell growth. So all that is outlined in that figure there. Um, but again, just your appreciation that cell cycling, um, cell signaling is important for cell growth. And that's how the growth factors um, allow for that end, that end output of your cellular response being cell growth. So we do want to remember that cell growth and cell division are not always coupled together. Um, so they can happen separately. Um, and so if you have growth factors present, this will allow for um, cell growth to happen. But we could have just the mitogen present and allow for cell division. So an example of this would be amphibians and cell C. elegans, which are a worm. Um, in their cell divisions, the cell would divide, um, but they actually end up getting smaller because there's not a growth that happens. Okay, so again, we want to, you know, we're, we generally talk about them happening together um, through the cell cycle, but again, keep in mind they don't always have to happen, that we can get cell division without that growth occurring. So we want to keep in mind that neighboring cells are competing for a limited supply of growth factors. Um, so growth factors can be secreted into the media, um, and this would initiate the cells to proliferate. But once they've reached a monolayer, the cells would no longer be proliferating because they're going to get signals from their neighboring cells. 
um, and that's actually going to inhibit cell proliferation. Now, cancer cells are able to bypass this inhibition, um, so they're able to continue to grow even though um, there's limited supply of growth factors, um, and also that there's this inhibition, they're um, turning off of cell proliferation. So myostatins, a protein um, that actually inhibits the process of myogenesis. Myogenesis is just um, cell growth and differentiation of muscle cells. Um, and so here's an example of a, a bowl um, that actually has a mutation in its myostatin. Um, and so it's not able to turn off the signal um, to stop myogenesis. And so you can see how um, the muscle structures are much larger. Um, so sometimes these um, animals are referred to as double muscled. Um, and so um, again, this is a mutation that's been um, selected for. Um, so I guess some people, some people who like cows like these cows with these double muscles. Um, but again, you can see how if if this um, mechanism is turned off, um, how it actually increases the overall tissue size uh, that is present. Okay, so this will conclude this audio lecture. Again, there it will be a second audio lecture on apoptosis um, that you should um, listen to for this chapter.